for he's a pretty good puppet. For he's a pretty good puppet. For he's a pretty good puppet. Then nobody can avoid. Yay! Happy name day, Wormbo. Here you go, buddy. Now dig in. Oh, boy! Oh, my. Wow, he yep. really just licks it. Dives right in. Yeah, there's no biting. He's that licking? Yeah, he's licking it up. He's licking the whole cake up. He's just absorbing it. Yeah, I warned you. Does Mr. Cody and Miss Katie want some cake? Yeah, no thanks, pal. <sighs> it's mostly just sawdust, so enjoy. Oh, hello there. You're probably wondering what we're doing. Might be a bit startling to see us all here in one location. Well, we realized that it's been a full year since we first discovered Wormho. Or rather, a year since we first gave him his name. That's right. If you recall, Wormho was originally a featured character in the Some More News movie, but that was before we became... Trapped with him. Yeah. We're trapped with Wormho. What are you two talking about? Oh, we're just... Talking about the day your name was born. Oh, a story! Wombo loves stories! Well, you know, it's not so much a story as it is a single email exchange where one of our writers asked what we should name the puppet, and then I just threw out the name Wormbo as, like, the second thing that came to mind. And then everyone was like, okay, sure. And that's what we went with. Tell us, Mr. Cody. Tell us the story. I just did. Yeah. So. Oh, um, Mr. Cody? Miss Katie? Yes, Wormbo. Where do Wormbos come from? Uh, well, Wormbo, you're you're kind of a puppet, at least most of the time. A puppet? Don't be silly. I don't have a hand in me. Yeah, actually, uh. Ah! What did you do to me? I'm a flesh-boned monster. Ah! <laughs> ah! Jesus Christ! Sorry, I thought you knew. Wombo doesn't like not having skin! Wombo doesn't like his name day one bit! What even is Wombo, Mr. Cody? What am I? What is Wombo? What is Wombo? Oh, you poor little idiot turd boy. Cody, we need to cheer him up. You don't mean... Yeah, I do. Okay, fine, Warmbo. But some ground rules, all right? No kissing on the mouth, all right? Also, we're not doing that John Krasinski fake good news hogwash. I don't want to talk about some kid opening a lemonade stand to fund their own brain surgery or any other feel-good story that's actually the result of a systemic problem. Those are headlines created to give clicks to local news because local news is dying. It's just compounding bummers. Right. No corporations doing single good deeds for PR when they could be doing a bunch of obviously better things instead. Also, maybe no, like, GoFundMe stories either. They're mostly always inspired by ungodly systemic injustices. Like, it's great that they raised $625 million for COVID-19 related hardships in 2020, but that doesn't solve the problems that created those hardships. Not to mention that out of the 165,000 pandemic related campaigns on their site, 40% of those received exactly zero donations. Oh, did we mention, by the way, no kissing on the mouth, Warbo? Yes, but that bears repeating. Yeah. No kissing us on the mouth, Warbo! Well, geez, you silly goats! What does count as a good news story? Any systemic change in the right direction. Like how so many places in America are now expunging marijuana-related charges, or how solar power is getting cheaper and more powerful. Those are signs of larger, broad changes, while still coming with their own nuances to work out. That sounds boring! It is boring, Warmbo! Most actual good news is boring, and incremental. That's why it would be cool, you know, if a certain someone was a little more receptive to eating inedible objects, but like, what are we gonna do? Sneak into their house and hide pennies and all of their groceries? Right, cause that would be illegal, Katie. And extremely entertaining. Anyway, Cody, sounds like you got an episode on your hands, so I'll just let you get to it. But I thought this was a gift for Mr. Cody and Miss Katie. Oh, f Wombo would be so happy if Miss Katie told Wombo about some good news! And, and perhaps, perhaps 
just for Wombo. You don't have to talk about the Democrats or those pesky Republicans. Sure, Wombo. And perhaps Mr. Cody can use the time to go through his kitchen and look for any pennies, because apparently I have to do that. You want to help me, buddy? Can do. All right. Have fun doing the good news, sucker. Thanks. Best friend? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, yeah, no, so this is different. Looks like I'm gonna do some news for ya. Look, I know it's weird and I'm new here, but look, I think that we're gonna have a uh, pretty fun time, right? You could call it a holiday special if that makes you feel better. And I think that means that we have to start by saying, Here's some good news. Weed isn't the only drug that's getting slowly decriminalized in this country. Sure, sure. We all love doing mushrooms when we're going to the planetarium or a music festival or the dentist. But did you know that they can also be used to treat depression? Specifically, I'm talking about psilocybin, the psychoactive chemical compound found in more than 100 species of fungi, which can impact cognition, mood, and perception by activating your brain's serotonin receptors. And while this drug is more associated with taking a lot and then tripping your balls and or ovaries off, it's possible that lower doses could allow people with depression to function in their daily lives. You know, microdosing. I'm sure this isn't new news for yous. And speaking of not at all new news for yous, people are pretty damn bummed right now. You know, on account of the COVID. Humans generally don't like being trapped inside for several years. And so, an August 2020 CDC survey indicates that depression symptoms quadrupled among Americans during the first year of the pandemic. Because, yeah, of course it did. We couldn't hang out with our friends or go to the movies or take acid at the dentist. So people, you know, could really use a win right now. Like, Perhaps seeing their favorite YouTube star swallow a penny. Or, failing that, better access to drugs and treatment that could ease depression. But of course, they don't need to be the right drugs, and it turns out that only 28% of patients who report major depression symptoms say that their conditions lessened following the standard course of treatment, specifically selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. It can take six to eight weeks before someone can even start to see any benefit from those kinds of drugs, which... Sorry, it's a long time if you're experiencing severe PTSD or suicidal ideation or other debilitating symptoms. So even if you have the resources to afford a therapist and, you know, you build up the courage and energy to go see that therapist and you get prescribed and purchase a new medication, you will still have to wait six to eight weeks before you even know if it's going to do anything. And considering that two thirds of all patients who take these drugs don't respond to the first medication that they're prescribed, your initial chances aren't even all that good. And that's on top of the side effects. Oh, wait, did I mention the side effects? Stuff like nervousness and a reduced sex drive, which honestly just sounds like having depression all over again. And so the point I am making here is that the way we are currently treating these conditions sure seems like it could be better. Meanwhile, clinical trials suggest that psilocybin could be particularly helpful at treating anxiety and depression disorders that have proved resistant to other forms of therapy. This is why the drug received a breakthrough therapy status upgrade from the FDA in 2018, allowing some limited and controlled forms of research to begin. I mean, the drug was first investigated for potential therapeutic uses way back in the 50s, so, you know, not much of a breakthrough. But of course, we can thank America's war on drugs for why this is just taking so dang long. Hey, real quick, how'd that war on drugs work out again? We won decisively? No? No more drugs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's it. So... Despite its many potential benefits, the Federal Controlled Substances Act of 1970 classified psilocybin as a Schedule I substance, restricting its manufacture, importation, and use, even for verified medical research. But don't worry, because this is about good news, remember? 
is, I swear. Because as of this recording, nine U.S. cities and the entire state of Oregon have officially decriminalized or legalized psilocybin. This includes Detroit residents voting to decriminalize psychedelics entirely back in November. Also in October, Seattle's city council voted unanimously to relax the city's rules against so-called entheogens. Enthe enthe doesn't matter. Entheogens, which are psychoactive substances that occur naturally in plants like shrooms, peyote, and ayahuasca. So while local governments can't actually ease any major regulations that hold back on scientific research, it is nice to see that possession or sale of these drugs have become a low priority for cops. Right next to actually stopping crimes and respecting basic human rights. Ayo! So, you know, you still can't have it prescribed to you, sure, but at least you can do a bunch of mescaline in the comfort of your own public mall fountain and not feel paranoid about getting into too much trouble. But you might wonder what we are doing to speed up research on psilocybin and other drugs that might ease depression. Well, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has introduced two separate amendments that would allow for more research on psychedelics and other Schedule One drugs. So far, neither has passed, but the second one went down by a narrow margin, so that's something, yeah? Technically good. Or perhaps more gooder than you think, because along with AOC, both Rick Perry and Rep. Dan Crenshaw have shown at least some support for using drugs like psilocybin and MDMA as therapy for veterans. It seems that this is not a partisan issue, which in this country is like a fucking miracle. It is Marine blown up in Afghanistan about a year before I was blown up. Terrible TBI issues for years and um, said that this uh, that, that the psychedelic treatments had, had changed his life. So it was just very strange that I was getting both of these testimonies um, within the span of, of 24 hours. So we're gonna hear about that today. This is, this is, this is focused on MDMA, also known as uh, ecstasy. Hey Dan, glad you're on board. Maybe you and the rest of the GOP don't have to personally experience something to change your mind and develop empathy. I don't know, just a suggestion. Anyway. Speaking of MDMA, it's not just mushrooms that people are looking at for possible treatments. In 2017, the FDA declared MDMA, the key ingredient in the party drugs Ecstasy and Molly, another kind of breakthrough therapy that could be legally studied in a controlled environment. The drug increases feelings of closeness, enhances emotional empathy, and promotes thoughtfulness and contemplation, which some neuroscientists believe could prove particularly helpful when combined with other forms of therapy that confront personal trauma. Also, ketamine shows some initial promise as a treatment for severe depression. And unlike conventional SSRIs, ketamine often takes effect right away and doesn't require that same six to eight week waiting period. It also has the benefit of already being legal for doctors to prescribe off-label right now. You know, if you slip them some cash or like threaten them. And that's really the biggest challenge we're going to hit with this. And like everything in this country, which is accessibility. Specifically when it comes to lower income and non-white people. For example, that summit Crenshaw was speaking at was by the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, who recently trained a team of 285 therapists to help guide patients through MDMA-assisted therapy. Except just 10% of the experts they trained were people of color. Additionally, when it came to therapies involving relaxing or soothing music, that music tended to be geared toward one specific, often white-skinned culture. I'm guessing a lot of prog rock, maybe some Bon Jovi. You know, music where if you saw it live, you'd be asked to clap your hands above your head a lot. Oh, I do love Weezer, though. What I am getting at here is that the places leading the way in decriminalizing these drugs, the Pacific Northwest, for example, already attract a specific kind of industry the tech bro industry, to be exact. And so what we're seeing are a lot of tech startups taking advantage of this psychedelic boom. And as we are learning with dismay, tech billionaires aren't exactly great when it comes to catering to anyone that isn't wealthy and white. They're super at making apps that simulate like 
fart sounds and junk. Sure, yeah, you know, coming up with cool inventions like making banks, but on the internet. Great stuff, guys. Really great work inventing online shopping. But when it comes to large and complicated social and societal changes, not so great. The tendency is to focus more on making something cool and futuristic than making it practical. Like investing money in a series of underground tubes to drive smart cars through instead of just making, I don't know, trains. I know we love to talk about this, but someone once invented a $400 device that just squeezed bags filled with juice. already seeing these startups focus on magic mushroom boutique vacations and even VR experiences. One such retreat is offering shroom trips for the low, low price of motherfucking $4,300. For context, you can get a bag of shrooms for about 30 bucks if you know the right person. And if you don't, just give me a call and I'll hook you up with my guy Razor. Razor's great, you'll love him. Just don't cross him. No need to pay the cost of a fucking car, okay? Meanwhile, ketamine clinics are already straying away from science and exaggerating their health benefits. And then there's Field Trip Health, a company that's currently offering $750 ketamine therapy trips that absolutely are not covered by insurance. That's almost 800 bucks for just one session. Again, and I cannot stress this enough, you can get this drug at, for like six bucks at Walgreens if you have a coupon. And while they stress the therapy side, these places are presented more like high-end health spas than medical centers. Places for rich people to soak and talk about whatever rich people talk about. Boats? I don't know. Field Trip is even developing their own proprietary versions of psilocybin that will cut down on the length of the trip, which sure sounds like an unfun way to squeeze more money out of the consumer. Already, 47 publicly traded firms have a focus on psychedelic therapy, with 34 more private companies joining in the fun. And that includes Atai Life Sciences, which is backed by none other than Peter Thiel. And if that name alone doesn't bum you out, then you are probably Peter Thiel watching this. Hi, Pete. Let me know if you want any blood. I've got some great blood. Yeah, the title monkeys bit me several times. The point to all of this is that we are certainly getting there, but also don't hold your breath. Unless that's something that you like to do to get high. But at the same time, the progress we are making in just a little bit of time is incredibly encouraging. Not just for folks with anxiety and PTSD problems, but also for people who just want to get like super fucking high without the cops showing up, man. Hey. Yeah. Did you fill my milk carton oh. with pornography? What? Do you have a problem with sex work or something? It it's in my milk. Like, you printed out very explicit pornographic images and put them in the milk. Like, I'm I'm not going to accidentally eat that with my cereal or something. Cody, I am not sure what it is that you are talking about, but I hear you, and I am here to work with you to resolve the situation. Okay, so what did I miss? Well, we've been talking about decriminalizing drugs and how the cops suck super bad, and honestly, it's been going really smooth. It's a pretty easy gig you got here, man. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, look, I'm going to take over for now. Could you just go through my kitchen and just take out all the food with, like, stuff in it? Yeah. Sure thing, buddy. Right on that. Tag me out. Okay. Cody, say tag me out. Ah, tag. Okay, Warmbo, are you around still? I'm right here, Mr. Cody. Classic. Always here. 
Are you learning a lot so far? Yes, thank you for asking. So glad for that. Hey buddy, since it's your special day, do you want to transition us over to an ad break? Why sure. Don't go anywhere or Wombo will find you. Wombo knows you. Don't think Wombo doesn't know you. Uh, cool. Let's go to ads then. Hey, news pervs. If you're like me, you probably have a friend who only eats potatoes they find in dumpsters outside of restaurants. Let's call them Brody. You go out for like a nice friend dinner and they refuse to eat anything and then you find them hunched over in the sidewalk snurfing a potato into their bearded hole like some kind of spud vampire. So this holiday, why not give your friend the gift of nutrition with AG1 by Athletic Greens. It's a quick and easy way to get all your daily vitamins in one sitting. Mmm. Yum. Just one scoop contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, multi-mineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more in one convenient daily serving. It fits all your food preferences and supports energy and focus, aids with gut health and digestion, and supports a healthy immune system. And you can probably sneak it into a potato or two. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune support free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit athleticgreens.com slash more news today. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash more news to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. Go on. Hi, it's me, your friend Wombo. Do you ever think about how you're gonna die? Wombo thinks about it all the time. Not about Wombo, but about how you're gonna die. And so maybe you should, um, think about life insurance? Wombo can't die, but Wombo has noticed that when humans die, they often leave behind a lot of debt, or maybe they have people who depended on them, and so it's good to have that financial cushion in case you die for some mysterious reason. That's where PolicyGenius.com can help. You can head over to PolicyGenius.com and answer a few questions about yourself and in just a few minutes you can work out how much life insurance you need and compare personalized quotes to get your best price and just maybe you could save 50% or more on life insurance. They got 5 star reviews and have helped over 30 million Wombos shop for insurance and so if you go to PolicyGenius.com you can get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save! That's policygenius.com! Do it before something happens to you! And we're back! Great job, everyone. Way to watch those ads. Hey, Warmbo, what do you think about, uh, cops? Do you agree that they perhaps kinda like super suck or. Well, well, Warmbo does understand that there are a few bad apples. I'm gonna stop you right there! Second question, Warmbo. Wouldn't it be nice for all those helpful police officers if they perhaps didn't have to handle every little thing on their own. What do you mean, silly goat? Well, good news! Social workers are beginning to replace police work. Ooh, that sounds neat! It is neat! Hey, why don't you f right off so I can explain it, buddy? Okay! Cool. Hey again, folks. I hope you're all doing okay. I mean, I'm not. Got a lot of milky porn to deal with, but otherwise, I'm swell. So we're talking about how cops kind of suck a lot, and there was this whole protest about that. Do you remember that? The protests about all the videos where cops were just executing mostly black men for low-level crimes, or in some cases, for nothing at all. And America got thinking about how maybe we don't need cops to show up for every little thing, mainly because cops are trained specifically to be God or alpha dogs with a single pew pew tool they use to solve every problem from routine traffic stops to mental health crises. And then ironically enough, those police protests led to countless new videos of cops acting disproportionately violent against the protesters protesting how disproportionately violent they are. And then America just stopped talking about it altogether because something even worse happened. Probably like, like a virus. The virus of free thought! Anyway, that's all the bad stuff we had to touch on to get to the good news. And the good news is that in all of that mess, some cities did actually listen to the protesters. Homelessness, substance abuse, and mental illness have plagued the transportation system. Tomorrow, BART will unveil a plan to hire 20 new employees trained in social work 
who will ride the trains and respond to those problems with an armed police officer. So, okay, still not perfect, what with cops still being involved, but public transit systems tend to be a place where folks with mental health issues and or a lack of housing congregate because it's one of the few shelter options they have. And like, I don't know, perhaps that's something we need to work on and not just put a band-aid over. But it used to be that these extremely vulnerable humans were often met with a combination of medieval contraptions meant to keep them off of benches mixed with some aggressive cop whose only recourse against mental illness was a pair of handcuffs and made or shooting a dog. And so to rectify this, the Bay Area Rapid Transit has put out job listings for crisis intervention specialists and transit ambassadors to patrol their subways. This was after they found that 40% of all their transit police calls were related to wellness and medical assistance instead of crime. So when you think about it, it's actually extremely weird that all of the cities haven't been doing this for decades. And not just in their subways either. By rough estimates, police only get called for violent crimes around 4% of the time, while stuff like traffic accidents and non-criminal calls take up the largest chunk. Medical emergencies are about 6 to 9, nice, percent, while around 12% is property crime. It's a lot of multitasking that rarely requires a firearm, and probably why when the DC Police Reform Commission handed in a report designed to reimagine our approach to public safety, they found that the best recourse of action would be to replace most first responders with behavioral health care professionals who could work in tandem with cops and even help train them in dealing with these non-violent calls. Additionally, we would reduce the overall police presence and completely eliminate them in places like schools, as well as get rid of low-level crimes like panhandling and strengthen our social programs designed to promote anti-violence in our communities. This would ultimately reduce the funding for the police. I, I wonder if there's like another word for that. That's yeah, close enough. Stuff like this is happening all over the US. And in fact, right before we started shooting this episode, Los Angeles announced a similar system for responding to those experiencing homelessness. But it should be noted that this isn't one blanket policy we can apply to the entire country, so much as a mindset we need to be shifting to on a national level. In short, politicians and citizens need to recognize that police are only a fraction of what a city needs to utilize in order to keep the peace. And dumping everything on law enforcement isn't the most effective strategy. At least until we get some kind of like, like a multitasking robot cop, which I'm sure would be super good and totally not political satire in any way. So we can do this by introducing mental health services and slowly transitioning away from the police system we have now. That's not a political belief, but rather just a fact we're currently ignoring. Yes, Statistically speaking, violent crimes will go down if you add more cops, specifically as a prevention tactic. But aside from the fact that it doesn't address root problems and is maybe not the world we want to live in, that data is also from the cops and doesn't include instances of wrongful shooting or police brutality. We don't really have that data because it turns out the police have been lying about it for decades. Shocker! And so with our current system, we're sacrificing human rights for lower crime stats that might not even have much to do with the cops, and there are absolutely better options for us. And so once we're all able to recognize that, we can begin this broad discussion that's barely even off the ground. For example, in all this talk about replacing police with social workers, we rarely actually ask social workers what they think. I bring this up because it turns out that not all of them think using them to replace cops is actually a good idea. Not because they believe police are the better option, but rather that social work itself would need to be reformed for this idea to work. After all, most social workers already work closely with the police, not as first responders, but rather in prisons and psychiatric facilities. And a lot of their hesitation to replace cops comes from the fact that they are still legally required to work for the police, often to incriminate the people they are trying to help. It's hard to gain someone's trust when you're literally there to rat on them, you know? Not to mention, the police would be in charge of deciding whether to send a social worker at all. In Oregon, for example, their 30-year-old crisis assistance program has been often seen as a good model for the U.S., except for the fact that police can choose to not implement it whenever they want. 
And when you think about it, social work is almost the exact opposite of what police work is in this country. Or as one worker puts it, we prioritize our vulnerable clients' needs over our own fears. Unfortunately, as we've seen in many police shootings, officers often do the opposite. That's a pretty sick burn from a social worker considering that they're professional buzz kills. Like, come on, sure, maybe I hire an orphan child or two, but I still pay them. Hey, cigarettes count as payment, come on. None of this is to dissuade us from making efforts towards defunding the police, but rather to point out how nuanced this transition needs to be. I know this is supposed to be about good news, but this is actually how most good news on a systemic level works. It's boring and involves a lot of nitpicking. It's usually gradual and often starts with individual stories that serve as a model for a larger change. A good example of this is how cities have begun to pass laws designed to prevent cops from stopping drivers for low-level offenses. This is pretty darn important on account of how in the past five years, police have killed 400 unarmed drivers or passengers in traffic stops that were not related to violent crime. The most common of these encounters were extremely low level. And so if cops can't behave themselves for things like a broken taillight, then they shouldn't be allowed to enforce them in real time. That's more than fair when the alternative is allowing them to administer Judge Dredd executions for speeding violations. After all, we have traffic cameras that can mail people tickets if they speed or run a red light, so why not just do that instead of pulling someone over? We just, you know, we need to rethink some basic systemic things here. The snag we also hit is that by questioning these things, we end up questioning the larger system as well. And boy, people don't like it when we do that. It becomes daunting and easy for people to give up. Like, did you catch that viral story about a bunch of dads hanging out at a high school in Shreveport, Louisiana? It was in response to the school's recent trouble with fights and police arrests. And so a bunch of dads got together and began taking shifts, interacting with the students in order to to de-escalate bullying and conflicts that might occur. They call themselves dads on duty, presumably because duty is a funny word and dads are what they are. And there hasn't been a single instance of violence since they showed up. But of course, we can't just do this everywhere. Part of what makes this work is the personal connection these dads have and the fact that they're able to take time off to accomplish this. You could presumably implement a volunteering system, but would still run into conflicts with stuff like job obligations, job obligations, and so on. People need money to survive and buy cool some more news merch. And so when you think about it, wouldn't it be really neat if our larger system was perhaps designed so that parents don't don't have to choose between caring for their child or getting money to spend on caring for their child. You know, like if there was a universal basic income, that's just a random thought. And hey, speaking of jobs and obligations and all that, we have more ads for you because those children can't pay for themselves in cigarettes. Ha ha, ad time, breaking now. One, two, three, go. Wait, one, two, three, go. Ad time, one, two, three, go. Ad time. Ads time. Hey folks, you know, secretly being the graffiti artist Banksy can be a lot of stress. You're always looking over your shoulder and you gotta wear a bunch of dumb masks and pretend you're British. And that's on top of all the stencils and paint I have to buy online. And that's why I use ExpressVPN to hide my IP address so that my Banksy activity can't be traced back to me. ExpressVPN will not only make it harder for your data to be tracked and sold to advertisers, but they encrypt 100% of your network data to protect you from exposing all of your secrets. Like how I'm Banksy. So let's stop giving the big tech companies all our information, like, for example, how I am Banksy. All you've got to do is visit expressvpn.com slash some news. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash some news to get three extra months free with my exclusive link. Go to expressvpn.com slash some news right now to learn more. And don't tell anyone I'm Banksy. If you could keep that between us. Thanks. 
Mm -mm -mm. I sure do love teeth, shiny teeth, smooth teeth. Sprinkle a little salt on the teeth and slurp them up. Sometimes I'll eat teeth raw, right out of the mouth. It's important to take care of your teeth, which is why I want to tell you about Quip, the electric toothbrush that is loved by over 7 million mouths. Lord knows how many delicious teeth that is. I won't do the math. Quip has a lightweight and sleek design for both adults and kids and uses timed sonic vibrations vibrations to guide a dentist recommended two minute clean. And with Quip's new smart motor, you can track and improve your brushing through a free Quip app, an app for your teeth. My goodness, get those teeth nice and clean for Cody. And Quip isn't just a single brush either. They will deliver all your teeth needs straight to your door. They have the floss. They have the anti-cavity toothpaste. They have sugar-free gum, mouthwash, brush head replacements, and... That's the list. All the teeth swag you need delivered with free shipping. Did I mention it's all affordable and these brushes start at just $25? If you go to getquip.com slash more news right now, you will get your first refill for free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash more news. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash more news. Quip, the good habits company. Treat your scrumptious teeth right and mail them to Cody. Hey, we are back and we are Katie now. Cody's mad because I pulled all his food out of his fridge and cabinets like he asked me to. But I didn't tell him which foods have inedible objects hidden in them. All of them. So I'm going to do this next bit of good news. Also, I got Warmbo a gift. Huh? Free eyeglasses, buddy. Hey, aren't those my glasses? Ooh, free present for Wombo! Those were very expensive, and he doesn't even have real eyes. What do you mean I don't have real eyes? What is Wombo? Hey, hey, do not listen to him, buddy, okay? It's your name day, and people like free stuff on their special days. You like free things, don't you, Wombo? Wombo loves free things! <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. And you would agree that the things people need to survive should also be free, right? People don't pay to breathe or drink water, right? I mean, besides bottled water, which perhaps shouldn't be a thing. My point is, being alive shouldn't really cost anything. We don't decide to be born into this world or, I guess, being hot glued and poorly stitched together into this world. And it's weird, right, that people can run up debt just by needing the basic ingredients for a human being to stay alive, like food and shelter and medical care. There's this revolutionary concept that maybe the purpose of society is to progress. Otherwise, why aren't we all just living in caves and eating sticks and throwing poop at each other? Throwing poop is how Wombo rides the bus for free! Oh, that's great, buddy. And speaking of things that are great... If you could just... Ouch! You just ow, ow. Get over there. there we go. Much better. So here's some good news. Los Angeles is launching the nation's biggest guaranteed basic income program, also known as GBI, designed to give 3,000 families $1,000 every month for a year with absolutely no strings attached. That means no drug tests, no say in how they spend the money on stuff like food or killer some more news merch. The only catch, is that the program is specifically targeted at people living at or below the poverty line who have been faced with financial problems due to COVID and who have children or are pregnant. The program is called Basic Income Guaranteed Los Angeles Economic Assistance Pilot or Big Leap. Oh, Big Leap. Yeah, that obviously makes more sense, but I like mine better, okay? This is also not without precedent. In Stockton, California, they tried a GBI program for two years, giving over 100 people $500 a month. They found that everyone squandered the money on steak, lobster, and candy. Oh, wait. Oops. I'm sorry. That was a typo. They found that employment went up and depression went down. Wow. It's like when you give people enough money so that they can actually live with some basic comfort and dignity... They actually have the energy to do things like jobs and feel stuff like happiness, or at the very least, not situational depression. Yay! Not situational depression! Jesus 
Wombo, god damn it, you move extremely fast sometimes. Wombo has extra legs! Okay, well, just scuttle over there, will ya? Sorry, guys, he's had a lot of sugar and sawdust today, but yes, that GBI program was very, very yay! So yay, in fact, that San Francisco is trying out a guaranteed income program for a little over 100 low-income trans people who face an elevated risk from the COVID-19 pandemic. Minneapolis is also launching a $500 GBI program for 200 families. Eric Hansen, director of economic policy and development at the city of Minneapolis, said, using an income ceiling of twice the federal poverty guideline, we hope to show that GBI can give the financial stability to low-income residents to allow them to pursue education and job training, pay for reliable child care, or simply provide financial flexibility. Additionally, Gary, Indiana, is also piloting a GBI program of 500 bucks a month that's called the Guaranteed Income Validation Effort, or GAIF. Give. Whatever. I like mine, okay? While these GBI programs may have been spurred on by the pandemic, leaving people in financial crisis, there have been trial GBIs all over the world that show something pretty weird. When you give people money without means testing or limiting what they can spend it on, they typically use it to improve their lives. The New Leaf Project, a Canadian charity, gave homeless people in Vancouver 7,500 Canadian doubloons. Sorry, no, I guess, I guess they're just called dollars, but that doesn't sound right. Okay, Canada. So 7,500 Canadian dollars into the hands of 50 people going through homelessness. And they found that compared to a control group of unhoused people who didn't get the money, the recipients spent fewer days homeless, moved into stable housing after about three months, and spent 83% of their money on food, rent, medication, bills, clothes, and transportation. Meanwhile, spending on alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs dropped by 39%. There were positive results from GBI programs in Finland, in Spain, and Germany is also trying out its own pro program. But also, hey, Canada, I don't know, maybe don't experiment on the homeless. They're not some soulless creature you can break into the house and sneak porn and pennies into their food, you know? So maybe just give them all money instead of having a control group. I don't know. Like, we shouldn't have to prove scientifically that giving people money is good. It should just be a thing that we do. Or if they're kids, at least pay them in cigarettes or monkey meat or something. Can it, title monkey, unless you want me to sell you to Logan Paul. Yeah, that's what I thought, title monkey, that's what I thought. Something important to note is that currently these trial programs are GBIs, Guaranteed Basic Income, also known as Guaranteed Minimum Income. These are targeted towards people falling below a certain threshold of income, like the poverty level, and giving them money to make up for that. You may have also heard about UBI or universal basic income. Universal basic income isn't targeted towards a specific group of people based on their income. It's given to everyone, even people who suck, even the super rich people who really suck. And you might think it's weird to give already wealthy, sucky people this money, but feasibly you could solve that by increasing their taxes to make up for the difference. And if everyone is getting this money, they are much more likely to want the program to continue and to get upset if economic conservatives try to end it. As for the effectiveness of such a program, some economic studies seem to indicate that UBI is not only sustainable, but could grow the economy. Other economists insist that UBI isn't the best way to address poverty and homelessness. Instead, reforming current social safety nets would be better. It's like a debate or something. And look, I'm not an economist or, well, okay, I am, but I got my degree from my butt university. But it seems like even if UBI is less efficient, the problem with relying only on government programs for helping with low income is that they're easier to means test into the ground. As in determining which households are deserving of help and therefore limiting who sees the effects of the program. If a certain party got power, which they will, and wanted to cut these programs, they could do that without a lot of people noticing. But if you give everyone some money and then stop giving them money, 
they're more likely to be upset and rightfully blame the current people in power for stopping the GBI or the UBI. In other words, it's harder to quietly do away with it and then blame the next guy, even though we all love doing that in America. Another snag we have to think about is that if UBI gained popular traction, there's a chance that conservatives would only allow it if they cut all other welfare programs. And according to the Center on Policy and Budget Priorities think tank, this would actually result in less aid to the people who need it the most. So why should we do UBI if it's scary? Because if we do it right, then it's extremely worth it. But like everything we've talked about today, it's a very fine line to walk between effectiveness and actually making the situation worse. Think of it like autoerotic asphyxiation, but for the economy. Oh, Wombo understands now, like autoerotic asphyxiation. Right, you gotta edge that UBI. <laughs> And so basically, there are a ton of different pilot GBIs going on with a lot of encouraging results, but each implementation is slightly different, so it's hard to really have one definitive answer about how well GBI works. But we need to keep testing it, even if it's not perfect. The choice is between trying to help vulnerable people or literally just doing nothing and letting them starve. Maybe the truth is somewhere else in the middle. <laughs> oh, I hate you sometimes, Wormbo. Hey, did you put dead mice in my fish tank? Cody, how are you sitting there with Wormbo still here? <laughs> Duh, that is a pickle for sure. Oh, f it's my hand. Oh, God, why was Wormbo on my hand? I don't know. My hand was inside him. Yeah, what is happening to us? I don't know. Cody, I feel dirty. Yeah. I need to go wash my arm. Understandable. I'll take it from here. I'm back. Oh, hey, Wombo. We were just talking about you. Are you feeling any better? A little bit, but Wombo still doesn't understand where Wombo comes from. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe better not to dwell on that. Hey, look at this. Here's some good news. Encouraging progress has been made in the movement to return native land to native people and to involve those people in the extremely vital problem of what to do about climate change. Woo! Forgot how many mice I put in here. Hey buddy, why don't you go help Miss Katie with the mice? <gasps> Wombo loves eating mice! <sighs> So many legs. Anyway, we're talking about returning land to native people, which is extremely good and in fact the subject of one of our last videos. As we mentioned in that previous video, Queensland recently returned four national parks, nearly 400,000 acres of land, including the world's oldest rainforest, to Australia's indigenous eastern Kukuyulanji people. That's pretty huge, both in terms of the literal size of the land being returned and for proving that it's absolutely feasible to give back all that land white people stole. The historic deal was reached after four years of negotiations between the Eastern Kukuyulanji community and the Queensland government. The land contains Daintree National Park, which is considered the world's oldest tropical rainforest. According to Queensland Minister for the Environment and the Great Barrier Reef, Megan Scanlon, the Eastern Kukuyulanji people's culture is one of the world's oldest living cultures and this agreement recognizes their right to own and manage their country, to protect their culture and to share it with visitors as they become leaders in the tourism industry. As part of the agreement, Daintree, as well as Nagaba Balal, Kalkajaka, and Hope Islands parks will be jointly managed by the Kukuyulanji and the Queensland government, with the eventual goal of having the Kukuyulanji be the sole managers of the land. Eastern Kukuyulanji Traditional Owners Negotiating Committee member Chrissy Grant said that the land will be used to provide mentoring, training, apprenticeships, work experience, and employment opportunities for the Kukuyulanji people in the areas of trades, land and sea management, hospitality, tourism, and research. Just the the act of returning control of that land to Queensland's indigenous people could potentially create an entire network of jobs and educational opportunities and reinvigorate conservation efforts. That's a pretty huge deal that's caught the attention of everyone, even the very elderly. Today, I'm proud to announce the protection and expansion of three of the most treasured national monuments, our most treasured. Based on powers granted to the president under the Antiquities Act, first used more than a century ago by Teddy Roosevelt. First, Bears Ears National Monument in Utah. 
This is the first national monument in the country to be established at the request of the federally recognized tribes. You might not have understood what he was saying because of all the old man lips getting in the way, but that's President Sleepy Joe Biden his time until his next nap announcing that he would restore federal protection to the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante monuments in Utah, lands considered sacred to the state's indigenous people that contain priceless pieces of culture and history like petroglyphs and cave dwellings. According to the Bears Ears, Intertribal Coalition, a group representing the Hopi Tribe, Navajo Nation, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, Pueblo of Zuni, and Ute Indian Tribe, the Bears Ears Buttes are considered an important place of worship. Also, Buttes kind of looks like the word butts, so that's pretty cool too. The site was designated a national monument by Barack Obama in 2016 at the specific request of the area's indigenous people. But those protections were stripped away by President Big Strong Truck Driver, who reduced Grand Staircase by half and bears ears by nearly 90% to make way for fossil fuel mining, because obviously he would do that. And while Utah's governor Spencer Cox and Senator Mitt Romney both criticized the move because again, obviously, President Biden's decision was applauded by Jennifer Rocalla, executive director of the conservation group Center for Western Priorities. Rocalla praised Biden for actually listening to indigenous tribes and making sure the land would be protected for future generations. That's a neat new thing thing for the government to do, right? Actually listen to its people? Feels good, but also weird, like you might get f***ed at any second, you know? Like petting a dolphin. Meanwhile, the Department of the Interior has restored the National Bison Range, more than 18,000 acres of land in Montana, to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. The National Bison Range was created in 1908 as a wildlife preserve to protect the American bison from extinction, but the preserve reduced Salish and Kootenai land by thousands of acres. Now that land is being transferred back to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, which is already situated within the tribe's Flathead Reservation territory. The tribes are now managing the range's bison and are also helping co-manage bison from nearby Yellowstone National Park, using traditional methods that are much less stressful for the animals, such as allowing them to stay in family groups and avoiding techniques like storming and stampeding that, for obvious reasons, freak the animals out and harm conservation efforts. You know, unless you're trying to kill your lion brother and nephew, there's very few instances where causing stampedes is effective. And so it's part of a larger effort by the Department of the Interior to place native communities in charge of managing managing and co-managing public lands. It's similar to the arrangement between the Queensland government and the Eastern Kuku Yalanji, with the government basically admitting, okay, obviously we've proven we have no idea what the hell we're doing with this land we took from you, so you want it back? And can you help us fix it? Or can you help us fix it? Not really good at Australian accents. Believe it or not, the law leading to the transfer was signed last December by none other than former president Soft Baby Hands himself. Although it should be noted that this was part of a larger COVID relief package, so maybe he just skimmed that part and thought it was about a new Street Fighter movie or something. You get it? Bison. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> Oh yeah, you love those Street Fighter references! Anyway, earlier this year, the Department of the Interior also began the process of transferring land in Hawaii back to Native Hawaiians for the explicit purpose of constructing housing for people of Native descent, and is also in the process of allotting land to Native Alaskans who fought in the Vietnam War. Progress continues to be made on the East Coast as well, where ownership of five acres of sacred land was returned to the Rhode Island Narragansett tribe. The Narragansett were almost completely annihilated in a 16th 75 battle with English settlers known as the Great Swamp Massacre. And while the return of the land by no means makes up for the tribe's near extinction, it's an undeniably positive step in the right direction. You know, better than just naming a beer after them and moving on. Don't get me wrong, it's a good beer. But yeah, sacred land is better. This land was previously owned by the Rhode Island Historical Society, who transferred ownership to the Narragansett, placing them in charge of managing the land's preservation. The tribe's medicine man and historic preservation officer John Brown III said that the Narragansett were thankful that they could finally return to their ancestral home as owners rather than visitors. Giving that land back to a tribe that was nearly wiped from the face of the earth is such a pure good, such a necessary act that must be done for no other reason than it is the right thing to do. That it, it, it kind of restores some of your faith in humanity. Or sockmanity, I guess, in Warmbo's case, warm, warm bomity. Hey, Warmbo, what's the appropriate term here? 
that's not it either. Not going to dwell on it. Let's keep these good vibes moving. The Department of the Interior is also consulting with tribal leaders about leasing and treaty rights and other issues related to the broader initiative of protecting and restoring ancestral land to America's indigenous people. And recently, at the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, several governments, including the US, UK, Germany, and the Netherlands, pledged to give at least $1.7 billion of funding to indigenous communities to recognize their efforts in combating climate change, with the intent of giving these communities a voice in climate change policy decisions. The money will be used to help support Native communities in several ways, including building their own infrastructure, resolving territorial disputes, and backing national land reform. Not only are several governments around the world finally taking steps to both acknowledge and make amends for the centuries of abuse and neglect inflicted upon Native communities, but they're also beginning to include these communities in the fight against climate change. It's a genuinely hopeful development, and if things continue in this direction, the end result will be good for the entire planet. It, it feels weird to say, but some things are actually getting better, and I, I, I mean that literally. Like, my mouth has forgotten how to make that specific combination of sounds, so it physically felt weird for me to say it. It feels weird for Wombo to say anything because Wombo's mouth is just a mask for Mr. Cody's hand. I appreciate that you're in the middle of an existential crisis, Warmbo. I truly do. Existential crisis is actually one of the names we kicked around for you and this show. But let this genuinely good news spark a glimmer of hope in your tiny plastic eye. In all of our tiny plastic eyes. Because it is genuinely good news. And like all the news in this video, a lot of it started from a local level. From people pushing America to be a little better. Because America... Yeah, it didn't come from a great place. You know, what with how we've treated a lot of marginalized people over the years and other things. Lots of other bad things. But it's never too late to do something about that. Because it doesn't matter where you came from, Warmbo. What matters is what you do. You might be a spider-legged, mice-eating felt puppet wrapped around my sweaty hand, but you have touched so many lives. I have? Sure, buddy. Just... Don't read the YouTube comments or anything like that. That's right. You're perfect just the way you are, so long as you don't read the YouTube comments. Never read the comments! Hey, did you get all the mice? Oh, you know. Anyway, this was our gift to you, Warmbo. Systemic good news that, in fairness, could also be better news. You know, there's still a lot of work we have in front of us. Stuff like the infrastructure bill not nearly covering the sweeping changes we need in this country. We still have a long way to go with the pandemic, with abortion rights. There are a lot of incremental steps backwards that we need to address. It's very whack-a-mole, where you focus on one area and completely ignore another, and so on. And so what we need to think about is how some of these local or state efforts could perhaps be done on a larger scale. You know, by like a... <laughs> A president. Because despite what conservatives might have you believe, most Americans want these things. Wow, so we're all pretty lucky to have Joe Biden in the White House then, huh? Yeah. The point is, even if we're seeing slow progress, most Americans support things like fully legalizing marijuana. Heck, most of us want drugs decriminalized across the board. And sure, these are small sample polls, but it's still information that was unheard of even 20 years ago. Same goes for the support for taxing the rich, a universal basic income, paid family family and medical leave, and better actions against climate change. People are ready for this stuff, so we just have to do it, you know? So, if a lot of Americans support this stuff, why haven't we seen Joe Biden or the Democrats do anything about it? How are the mean Republicans stopping them when the Democrats have the majority in Congress? Wombo doesn't understand! Yeah, maybe you should think about that question, Wombo. I don't know, Google it or something, and then perhaps we'll talk more. Yeah, there's even a political group addressing these concerns of yours, Wombo. They're called the Lemon Party, and you should look them up as well. That's... yeah, do that too. I sure will, Miss Katie and Mr. Cody. You guys are always so nice to Warmbo and looking out for him. <laughs> oh, well, you know what that screaming means. Your name day is officially over, Warmbo. Time to get out of my house before I call the cops. Okay, silly goats. See you real soon. Did you know he could vanish? No. No, that's new. Did he teleport away or did he did he just turn invisible? Warmbo? But are you invisible? 
That's disturbing. Oof. Hey, when do I get my own puppet? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to make you a puppet, aren't we? You could be a little happier about it. I can't, actually. Well, I, I literally can't okay. be any happier about us having a second puppet. Hey, happy holidays, everyone. Yes, and a happy new year. May all your milk be filled with porn. So you didn't get rid of any of the porn? <laughs> Obviously not. But I did bring new porn. You put more porn in? More porn. Is it good porn? <laughs> yes. Good. Hey. Thanks for watching this episode of Some More News. We want you to like and subscribe to this channel. Yeah. And check out patreon.com for some more news and our merch store with Warmbos on it. And our podcast, even more even news. More news with her. And also, you can listen to this show as a podcast. And there's nothing else to say. Merry fucking Christmas. Christmas.